Hello, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us for this program. My name is Maureen Kalimba Simbi. I graduated from Tufts last May in 2020, and I'm a volunteer with Young Friends of Tufts Advancement. While at Tufts, I majored in engineering psychology and minored in engineering management. I was involved in the TCU Senate as the International Community Senator, and I was the treasurer for the National Society of Black Engineers. After graduation, I worked with Amazon as an area manager, and I'm currently exploring education leadership opportunities. This evening's event is being run in conjunction with our annual March to the Top fundraising campaign, which is a month long campaign that encourages our alumni to support funding priorities on campus through a series of special monetary challenges. These funding priorities include COVID-19 response, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the expected hardship fund, and financial aid. Tonight is an opportunity to learn more about those priority areas, the expected hardship fund. I'm very excited to have Camille Zariba and Jared Smith here with us tonight to talk about the fund and the critical support it is providing to current students at Tufts. Camille joined Tufts as the Dean of Student Affairs and Chief Student Affairs Officer in the June of 2020. Dean Lizariba brings her amazing background in higher education, teaching, advising, and legal expertise to everything she does at Tufts. Our other speaker tonight, Jared Smith, is director of the First Resource Center, as well as the program director of the BLAST program. Jared is also a young alum and graduated from Tufts in 2016 with a BA in sociology and has been supporting students these past five years. Both of our speakers have contributed so much to Tufts success over the years and their leadership has been critical during 2020. Dean Lazarba and Jared, thank you both for being here tonight. As we proceed with tonight's conversation, I invite Dean Lazarba and Jared to share some welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Maureen, for the lovely introduction. And thanks everyone for being here uh, tonight with us. Um, as you know, Maureen has said, I'm Camille Sariwar, and um, I have been at TAF since uh, June of uh, 2020 um, as the Chief Student Affairs Officers for ASNE. Um, I will say I've been told that a COVID year counts for many years, and it certainly feels that way. Um, and so I am, it, it has actually been a, a very meaningful and significant start, um, if only because I've been able to be a support and more collaborative, you know, co in collaboration with colleagues um, to be able to help our students get through this moment. So thank you. And hi again, uh, my name is Jared Smith. I use he, his pronouns. And yes, I did graduate in um, 2016, but it feels like forever ago. Um, I Just for this event, I'm okay with that being chaired, but I typically don't lead with being a, an alumni because to me, the student experience is so drastically different than what I had when I was here. Um, so it doesn't even you know, compare to what our students are, students are currently experiencing. And it's one that I um, you know, kind of tuck in my back pocket when we uh, have uh, moments like this. Um, but yes, I majored in sociology, um, and the last five years have been amazing. But um, as uh, Camille says, uh, the last year was one to remember um, and taught us a lot about how we uh, can support our students, but ultimately um, also how do we support ourselves um, through everything that is um, this pandemic. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dean Lazariba and Jared. Uh, before we jump into our discussion, I want to encourage everyone to post any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can at the end of our conversation. Let's start off with an overview of the unexpected hardship fund. Many people are not aware that the fund existed before the pandemic. Can you tell us more about what the unexpected hardship fund is and why the fund was started? Yes. Um, so just as an FYI, I'm trying to get my, my Zoom to be friendly. Sometimes it lags. Um, but the Unexpected Hardship Fund um, is offered as a resource uh, through the First Resource Center. 
Um, so just in case there's a quick crash course into what we do, um, the center supports first generation, low income and students with undocumented status. Um, and the fund is available uh, to all those students who fall into those respective categories. Um, in this case, um, the hardship fund is really uh, our way to really think about holistic support for students. Um, so just as a, another shout out, when I think about the fund, I first think about financial aid, where uh, Tufts is generous um, in meeting the demonstrated need of our students and their families. Um, but there is typically a lot of um, unseen or unexpected in this case, uh, costs of attending college and getting as much as humanly possible out of this experience. Um, so for us, what we started to notice um, a few years ago was that a lot of our students were shying away from opportunities that would, you know, really aid them in career readiness, really think about um, broadening horizons. Um, and the fund was really created with the ethos of opening the door to all those opportunities and removing um, as many financial barriers as possible so our students can just focus on being students. Um, in this case, that looks like a lot of different things. Um, we support some academic re resources as well as thinking through career goals um, and uh, medical needs and even medical emergencies in some cases. Uh, so I can talk a little bit more about that if you'd like, but the, just kind of that quick overview is what our fund is for and how uh, we use it to support students. Uh, thank you, Jared. I don't know if uh, Din Zarba has something to add to that. If not, I uh, could continue with another question. Jared, did, um, one of the things we could do is we can cover some of the general things that the fund um, has done, and I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to let you also have the floor up to you. Yeah, we, we can talk about some of those general things too. Sure. Okay, so I will get us started. Um, so some of the things that um, can fall under the classification of um, unexpected hardships, for example, if you think about um, the kinds of um, either experiences or materials that a student might need for co-curricular experiences or th things that are not something that falls under the traditional rubric of financial aid. And so um, a student who needs to travel for a conference, for a presentation, there are fees, there's travel. Um, even thinking about something like what, what will you wear? How will you present yourself? Um, there can be uh, fees and equipment uh, for certain kinds of courses. Um, if you want to take a uh, for example, a, a music course, a photography course, not everybody has access um, to uh, instruments, to you know, phot photographic um, equipment, which can be really expensive. Um, and research and lab uh, experiences can also um, have a lot of hidden costs or fees to them. And you know, they may not be things that one thinks of right away, um, but there are a cost to many of these things and they can also add up pretty quickly for students. And that can create not just a barrier for the student to being able to participate in that, but it also certainly has a direct impact on the kind of experience that they can have and in how they're able to develop to their fullest capacity while they're here. Yes, um, and I appreciate that um, because the one thing that I think is really uh, useful to think about um, how the fund is used is really to think about what are the things that happen outside the classroom, um, most importantly, um, that can really change the, the fabric of um, a student's experience. Um, so we can get even more granular. Um, so for one, I think about the big picture. Uh, so our medical, um, support can look like um, dental uh, support. So I've had a few students actually very recently um, reach out to me um, because they, they didn't know if they had dental insurance and they really were, they needed uh, uh, an emergency surgery, but they didn't know how to afford it. Um, so they were really choosing between, do I save the money that I have for uh, this emergency surgery or do I save it for a rainy day? Um, and those types of uh, decisions should not be on the, you know, on the front 
front of our students' minds? So, like, you know, how does that help those, you know, as I think through, the, you can see I get a little passionate, but as I think through this um, experience for many of our students, how can we remove that, that potential barrier that allows them to get what they need? Because why wouldn't you uh, get the emergency emergency surgery if you need that, while also, you know, remaining focused on the academics and the other many other things that they do while at Tufts. Um, so it, it does, it's pretty broad, um, but the idea is really to think about removing as many potential barriers while also enriching the student experience holistically. Another, another place that you can, another way to think about how some of these costs might come up actually are around, um, for example, you know, times between terms, how do you pay for storage? How do you move from one place to another? You know, and when you start to really think about it on in a broader way, you realize that there can be um, really many things that affect, as Jared was saying earlier, the decision making of the students and also, you know, what they're able to pursue or not pursue. And, you know, um, there are students who, um, I've worked directly with students, not at Tufts in my prior institution, who made decisions about what they wanted to major in at times because they felt that they wouldn't be able to pursue a different major because they wouldn't be able to, um, afford the kinds of things that would allow them to do that. They wouldn't be able to go to certain conferences. They wouldn't be able to have access to certain kinds of equipment. Um, the issue of internships, which is so important to students, there's a very big difference between a paid and an unpaid internship. And nowadays, most of those internships are unpaid. And again, it, it, these are the kinds of barriers that continually put our students in situations where um, they need to decide, you know, uh, between things that they might really want to be doing and, you know, more limited ways of trying to pursue their, um, their academic goals. And I will say these were all realities that were very much prevalent pre-COVID, um, very much prevalent during COVID, and if anything, have become more complicated. Um, I would say more complicated, uh, more acute, and um, even uh, um, there have been some newer unexpected pieces to all of uh, the things that have come out of that, um, um, out of being still in the pandemic. Thank you very much, Dean Zerba and Jared, uh, for answering uh, what the Unexpected Hardship Fund is and uh, how it helps students at Tufts. And as a 2020 grad myself, I know this has been very difficult for Tufts and students. And uh, the sudden switch to remote learning and living campus was a financial burden for many and highlighted a lot of barriers to student success. Uh, I want to know, can you tell us more about what the Unexpected Hardship Fund has funded this past year and some of the specific ways it has supported students? Thank you. Yeah, um, so to first, I, I like to sort of think about this um, fund as uh, pre and post COVID, we were sort of already getting to that piece of this conversation um, because many of the things that we do um, post COVID, uh, if you will, are still, um, are, you know, are different, but pretty much uh, aligned with the types of things the fund was created for. Um, I can quickly share a graphic that I think would really uh, might be helpful for our visual folks. Um, so, um, of course, let me just go up to the top here. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, we have our definition here. Uh, which is really useful um, when you think about uh, what the low income barrier is or uh, threshold, maybe I should say threshold here, um, the threshold um, for our students. So it actually is higher uh, than what the FAFSA um, you know, identifies as low income. Um, and that is actually done intentionally to think about the wide range of experiences that our students have. Um, and 10,000, an estimated family contribution of $10,000 or less 
um, is our way to really try and combat all the different types of hurdles and uh, struggles that our students um, experience. Um, so just want to scroll down quickly. Um, so just to really highlight this as well. Um, so you, you'll see that the medical copay fund is in a separate box from the unexpected hardship fund. Um, so for all of you to know, uh, the idea is that this fund is all of the same, the same uh, uh, monies. In this case, the idea is that for our students, they're requesting these things separately, um, which is for us, um, just a way to really make sure that we students understand the types of resources that are available to them, but it actually doesn't change where the money is coming from originally. So um, in the pre-COVID case, let me make sure I'm, uh, got showing you the right things here. Yeah. So in the pre-COVID case, um, it's really important to also highlight that we work alongside financial aid. Um, and that's really crucial because we do not are, are unable to cover anything that is included in the cost of attendance. Um, so textbooks is a really um, you know, big point here because a lot of students find textbooks to be cost prohibitive. Um, and we can sort of talk a lot about that. Um, but in this case, that is unfortunately a limitation of our fund and it's something that we cannot uh, support students in. Um, but when you think about uh, our unexpected hardship, many of the themes that um, Camille and I were just talking about is useful, uh, but some other uh, ideas that I really wanted to highlight are um, team passes for travel into Boston or surrounding area for an internship opportunity. Um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, sometimes tickets uh, to, to the theater, uh, just to think about broadening horizons. Sometimes that's required for a class. Um, just really trying to encourage our students to jump in um, with full force and not worry too much about what it might mean to, you know, take part in those types of activities. Um, as well as um, thinking through simple things like laptop repairs, um, even sometimes in some cases study abroad. Um, so for us, um, we have a relationship with our the European Center um, and work alongside the Telwars program to help students find ways to afford uh, that summer study abroad opportunity. Um, and this is our attempt again to really think about like what what can we do to support these students while also thinking about how what are, what does it look like on campus uh, to really take full advantage of what's available to you. Um, so. That's our pre-COVID bucket. Um, so that's really useful. And um, our students have really reported using it. So for our uh, post-COVID bucket, uh, we really work to pivot uh, the fund to really support the immediate need um, of our student population. So uh, March 16th, 2020, um, I'm not counting, uh, but that was when we closed. Um, and immediately um, we, we're receiving text messages, phone calls, emails about students asking, what, what should I do? How can I get home? I don't know what, how to navigate this. What, 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 what's the next step here? Um, so we started to really think through uh, you know, storage costs. That was one that um, previously wasn't uh, offered through our unexpected hardship fund, but it was an immediate need uh, because none of our students had anticipated having to store their things for two additional months. Um, another big point, uh, we, we started uh, also supporting students in buying laptops. Many of our students didn't have laptops at home or in some cases didn't have the essential, you know, uh, computer power to run all of the required uh, software and, you know, things that they needed to be successful in their coursework. Um, so we were also helping students manage that expense, as well as thinking through in the immediate sense, those flights. Um, so from day one, we were uh, buying flights, we weren't cross-referencing uh, any of the, um, uh, you know, financial need of our students. No questions asked. If you came to the first center, we would uh, support you in buying a flight to get you home safely, uh, which was great. Uh, a lot of students started to get the help to get the word out. We really worked hard with uh, three students who volunteered to help us to really think about um, making sure that people had quick and easy ways to get home. Uh, but of course, that didn't come without its challenges. Um, and for example, I think of like a good couple examples here where students were at their layaway uh, destination and uh, their home country said they were closing their borders. So we even in some cases had to help students even returning to campus um, and, you know, helping house them to make sure that they were safe, one, 
um, but to uh, able to continue the rest of their semester as successfully as possible. Um, so for us, it's it's it was dynamic um, and happened really quickly. Um, and we were poised um, in a lot of ways to support our students because of one, our close relationships with them. And they were able to talk to friends who weren't, weren't sure where to go um, and send them uh, to the first center so that we can begin to sort of have that conversation. Where do you need to go? What does that look like? How can we be of service? How can we help? Um, so that's really um, like the, the main piece here is that for us, uh, post COVID really changed the fabric of um, how the fund is used um, and what things we will approve. Um, it also really opened the door uh, in the summertime when uh, the Tufts received uh, money from the Trump administration through the CARES Act. Um, we also were in a position to support non-CARES eligible students. So the criteria that the Trump administration set um, was very stringent and didn't uh, cover all the students that we serve on campus. Um, so students would apply to the CARES fund as normal. Um, if they were CARES eligible, they would receive the funds from that from the government um, monies. But if they weren't, we were uh, using the unexpected hardship fund to award students um, and offer them the, you know, that little bit of support because no one planned for this environment. Um, and why, why wouldn't we offer it a help in ways that we can, regardless of um, the student's position? Um, it really, you know, for us, it was really about making sure that our students were okay, making sure our students were safe um, and as successful as humanly possible, given the insane odds that was finishing a semester immediately um, overnight, like virtually overnight. Um, so that's some of the things that I really wanted to uh, quickly highlight uh, as we think about uh, the unexpected hardship fund is to, you know, think about it as it, we never stopped supporting students, but we did sort of adapt um, to the need of our student populations and also trying to remain as flexible as humanly possible and uh, really opening the door for them to receive the support that they needed. And I'll uh, stop sharing for now. I think I, I do want to highlight the piece that Jared uh, just brought up about being able to support all the students who might fall into the category of need, but that were left out by the CARES Act because it was a significant number of students and very vulnerable populations as well. Um, and um, it, it really allowed us to be able to say, we're going to support everyone equitably, no matter what. Um, and it, it was a, a, I don't know that I can stress enough how helpful it was to not have to make uh, the kinds of distinctions that the CARES Act would have forced on us to be able to support students in a moment, not just of need, but also of uncertainty, right, where things were moving very quickly, particularly in the months of in the month of March, you know, I think if you had 10 seconds to make a decision that felt like a luxury, sometimes, um, and information kept changing every five minutes, I saw that uh, someone asked in the Q&A, were you trying to place students with other families and instead of flying them home? You know, that was an option in March sometimes, but not always. And students were also having to make decisions about, you know, in that moment, if you think back to what that was like, no one knew how long it might be, what it might mean if the borders closed. So you didn't know if you were asking your roommate, can I stay with your family for two weeks? or if that was going to mean until September. Um, and so, um, so I, I would say that, you know, the decisions are made very much with each individual student in mind and working with that particular student's circumstances and trying to think both, how do you resolve this issue right now and how do you make sure you don't create another issue of being able to get back um, or you know, not having what you might need at home. And so um, uh, it, it's a complicated set of things to juggle, um, but you know, the, the funding that we had really helped, um, I think, um, provide a, a, a 
a safety net for so many students? Um, I also think it's important to highlight um, the, the diversity of the student populations that we support. Um, so yeah, I, I talked you know briefly about a few students that um, you know kind of got turned away from their home countries. Um, but through through the duration of maybe you know uh, two weeks, uh, we sent students to I would argue around 15 or so countries um, around the world, and even in the sense of just how quickly and rapidly those situations were changing, those contexts were changing. Um, it, it really um, opened my eyes to think about how dynamic uh, some of our solutions have to be. Um, because for us, uh, it, was, it was a no brainer. We really strived as hard as we could to make sure that we supported our students holistically. Um, and number one, the number one thing on our minds was their safety. Um, so getting them home with their families um, to, to, to Camille's point around, um, you know, we didn't know how long it would be. Uh, we didn't know how the situation would develop. For some, you know, people, you know, it was extreme concern and fear around what should I do? Um, but we really uh, strived as hard as we could to say, okay, it doesn't matter the cost, let's get you home. Um, because at least you're with your family and they don't have to worry about um, how, how, you know, what's your next meal looking like? Um, how, how are you doing every day? You know, because um, you know, if you could be home, um, our, our goal was to make sure that they were safely um, home. And, and I would add to that too, if you think about the fact that we were in a pan, that we are still in a pandemic, you know, one of the main things that people worried about if you didn't, if you weren't able to get home was, how would I have access to healthcare, right? So it wasn't really an option to say, well, you will just house you anywhere because you needed to think about, will that student be safe? Will they have access to food, to support? And will they have access to healthcare? Um, and how can we make sure that they're in the, in the best position possible? So um, and that's just, you know, to highlight a little bit the many different strands that you have to sort of weave together very quickly um, to be able to support students. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Lizerba and Jared. Uh, I imagine adapting continually to the situation over the last year has been a major challenge for students and for your teams as well. We've talked a lot about what's happened in the last year, but I'd like to talk a bit about the horizon for this fund. What is the future of the unexpected hardship fund? How will it be used after the pandemic? And what role will it play in supporting students after this crisis? So one of the things that I would say to that, Maureen, and it's a good question, is that um, we've sort of started to say post pandemic or after more in the last few weeks, maybe even month, but we're really not quite out of the woods just yet. And to be honest, it's unclear uh, how will we transition out of this pandemic and how long might some of the impacts last? And so, um, I, I would say that we need to think about the effects of the pandemic as happening, not just in the past, but happening as we speak and happening into the future. Um, there are families whose uh, economic livelihood will be impacted next month that hasn't been impacted yet. And, you know, the the effects even on the national economy right are are not really understood just yet or how long this will last and i highlight that because there's still a lot of uncertainty around you know um, what will the fall really look like? You know, what will the effects of the vaccine really be? What will happen with variants? How will that impact what our students can and can't do? And for every student individually also, there are the many variables of the health, you know, their own health, the health of others in their family, the their economic resources, all of the other very important resources that, you know, help sustain each and every one of us um, in terms of being able to figure out, you know, um, 
our careers, our health, you know, our day to day. And so um, I think that we are in for a few years, uh, at the very least, of just sort of unknowns, right? They may not come at us as quickly as they did in March. Um, but there certainly will be a lot of um, effects that are still sort of rippling through um, and that I think will be affecting our students um, for, for quite a bit of time. Yeah, um, and, I, and I appreciate that, that note um, because all of the, the work that we've done to support students has definitely put the fund in a place of needing serious replenishment. Um, for us, we we did our best to think about safety first and think about how to support our students holistically. Um, you know, some of the things I didn't mention, but it's all coming back to me as I relived the last year is thinking about even offering Wi-Fi routers um, because there were students who didn't even have wi uh, adequate Wi-Fi at home using phone hotspots and things that just, you know, as we all are very well equipped with the Zoom environment, um, it just doesn't uh, stand up. Um, so, you know, I say that to say that you know, as we move forward, the first thing that I'm thinking about is how can I uh, really stand up and meet the promise of our new incoming class and make sure that they have um, full, uh, you know, availability of the fund in the same ways that uh, students in the, our previous years have had access to. Um, so that's something that is really fits with, with me as I think about next steps. Um, and, you know, I, I do have a few um, things I wanted to share uh, with you all as well as we think about what does the future of the fund look like. Um, so, you know, it, it, for, for me, it, it, the, the goal is to think about, again, removing those barriers, encouraging success, and also think about life-changing opportunities. Um, so as I think about that, uh, I, I first want to say that I really want to expand the fund. Uh, so right now, students have uh, access to $500 across all four years. While that's great, um, I really would love to see the fund reach a point where we could serve all of our students and offer them $1,000 for a lot of the unexpected hardships, unexpected needs that come along with being successful and also taking full advantage of the tough environment. Um, another one is to really think about um, increasing uh, access to our emergency medical expenses. Um, so this is something that uh, is really near and dear to my heart because the, the last thing I ever want a student to consider is, do I eat tomorrow or do I get necessary emergency care? Uh, do I choose to go to the ER tonight or something, you know, buy a textbook? Like, you know, the, the, that, that type of choice should not be something that we see our students making in the college context. It is something that um, while our fund offers $300, that's a very small limit. And in many cases, doesn't really serve the full need of, uh, you know, whatever uh, unexpected uh, costs that come with getting the necessary care uh, that they need. Um, and then of course, there's a few other notes that I wanted to make. Um, I really would love to see the fund adapted to think more about career readiness. Um, so for me, uh, one I would love is to think about research opportunities uh, for students who are not um, eligible for, uh, you know, government grants, uh, because research shouldn't be uh, only reserved for the students who are able to, um, you know, meet the very strict requirements when we think about our, uh, the populations that we serve, our international students, um, and in some cases, our students with undocumented status. Um, I really want to think about opportunities that give our students the full experience. They can join teams, they can learn, they can explore in all the ways we want them to. Um, and, and that shouldn't be a limitation to their experiences on campus. Um, and then the last one is one that I, I really also feel near and dear to my heart and could talk about this one all, all night, um, which is really thinking about, uh, you know, offering stipends uh, for unpaid opportunities, because there's not, there's, you know, there's nothing worse than seeing a student move away from a life-changing opportunity because it's unpaid and they don't live in the Boston area. Um, you know, yes, there are some funds in the Tufts, uh, you know, Tufts community that they could take advantage of, uh, but even those funds are so small for thinking about them paying rent, feeding themselves, getting to and from their internships and working. That is not a choice that I really think uh, lends itself well to, you know, securing that job offer when they're done, 
um, really opening the door for them to dive, um, you know, head first into any of the projects that they're working because they're spending some time thinking about all the other life choices that we all as adults make. But, you know, I want, I want our students to just explore and experiment. Um, and it really takes um, a lot of planning and financial means to kind of, you know, let, you know, let the, the journey speak for itself. Um, but it's something that I hear from our alumni all the time. Um, you know, I couldn't do X because I didn't have the funds. I couldn't do Y because I didn't have the funds. But those, those skill sets that they would gain in that environment would really have helped change the fabric of what they thought their career path would be. Thank you so much, Dean Lazerba and Jared. Uh, this was an inspiring conversation. Thank you for telling us about the fund. Uh, now we have a little time for some live Q&A. If you have a question, make sure you, you post it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'll look at some of the questions we have right now and uh, pose them. So question one, can you share one of your favorite stories, how the fund has supported a jumbo during COVID-19? Um, I have a, a few, <laughs> I have a few, um, but I'll start um, with one. Um, so for me, I think that the biggest thing um, that I thought about was um, helping our, our Kenyan students um, get home safely. Um, we had a lot of, um, you know, kind of like a, a, a group of well-connected students who happened to know each other just by happenstance, um, but uh, were really trying to find ways to, you know, get home, um, but once home, they, we, we realized that the resources that they um, had available wouldn't actually aid them in their uh, overall success. Um, so in this case, we you know, first tried to think about um, what do they need? So they really articulated that they didn't have uh, you know, consistent access to Wi-Fi, um, which is obviously not, not okay in this current context. So we um, helped them move uh, to Nairobi and set them up in, um, uh, you know, a living arrangement that would allow them to complete uh, their their schooling successfully and also help them um, remain together the entire time. Um, in this case, um, you know, it it wasn't host it was a hostel, um, which you know had individual rooms. Um, there were a lot of students in similar situations, so they were even able to build community, get to know each other better, and just really, you know, get the full breadth of their, uh, you know, finish their full journey while also, you know, being home, being close to their family, and being able to maintain that connection while safe. Um, so that's one that you know kind of jumped out at me as like the biggest. Um, you know, like victory because, you know, it, it felt really good to be able to help them because um, I was, you know, really concerned about many of our students who might go home and not have the things that we were able to help them with. Um, and, you know, think about, you know, what does it mean now that they're there without the means to do all the things that they need to? One thing that I will share, which is a, a, a kind of, um, it's a more general story, but for example, you know, one of the things that has been really hard about managing what happens during COVID is that, um, you know, we, it, it used to be that, for example, if you, you know, it was, it was much easier to accommodate students to stay on campus pre-COVID than it has been during COVID. And so um, COVID has required us to put so many different um, layers of care and support. And um, so um, at the same time, we have students who, you know, it's hard for them to go home, for example, over winter break, or there isn't a place actually really to go back to where they are in good shape and able to, to do the things they need to do. 
And we have made really, really sure to take care of those students. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was really um, just uh, quietly proud of, you know, uh, for for our teams, you know, um, Jared's team, our team is uh, when the winter housing issue came around, um, we did some uh, we decided to go back to the the lists of students that we knew that had asked us for help in March and that had asked us for help over the summer that they needed a place to stay and reached out to them directly um, before, um, you know, any of the more general messaging had gone out to say, look, you know, we know that you've been in a um, in a position of hardship before, you know, we just want you to know that we're here. If you're in the same situation, we have a place for you. If things have changed and you don't need it, and some of them, you know, had different situations and didn't need a place to stay anymore. Um, but I, I was really, um, it, it was just very meaningful to me that, you know, there was a lot of thought and care from the team everywhere, thinking ahead to these students, making sure that, you know, as much as we can, instead of having them come to us to say, I need X, that we could say to them, you know what, we've got you covered. We know that you needed this um, and we don't want to put that extra burden on you. And that's something that, um, you know, I just thought was a, was a, a just a, a nice way of being able to help students out. Um, and over winter break, we had students for almost a month actually who stayed and we made sure that they had meals covered. I'll say that we've had to, you know, I think we have all been incredibly creative about being able to cover meals during times when dining, you know, can't be there for that. Um, some of that, you know, was covered through the CARES Act. Some of that for students who were not covered by the CARES Act were covered by the fund. And so that's where the fund can sometimes make such a huge difference also in terms of what we're able to do in, you know, uh, moments like winter break, for example. Um, you know, we're, we are already planning and thinking ahead for what happens over the summer and what are some particular needs that students might have in a, in a still COVID summer that isn't quite like it was last year but it's not quite what it was in the in the before time or whatever we want to call that moment so um so those are just some of the ways in which we're thinking um about that and that you know those are ways in which we um feel like we can really have a positive impact on students lives Sorry, Marina, I, um, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, the second question here, thank you so much for the answer for the first question. The second question is, what is the most frequent thing student asks for uh, that the fund supports? That's a really hard question. I think it depends, right, Jared? Wouldn't you say it? It's cyclical. Yeah, um, it, it, it does depend, um, but I think the, the most consistent overall um, has been our um, conference fees. Um, many of our students either want to attend um, or even or many of them are presenting. Um, so getting to conference registration fees, et cetera, um, as well as laptop repairs. Um, of course, you know, uh, that's one that goes without saying, um, but it is one that, uh, you know, kind of, I like to highlight as our pivot um, because then we were able to support students in purchasing laptops that would, uh, you know, be able to fund the necessary software and also run appropriately. Um, but those are like the two big buckets that I think about. Uh, and and sorry, I just like <laughs> um, since COVID though, um, it has been more uh, aligned with housing and food. Um, so. You know, it, it has changed a bit, uh, but I do think, you know, those four categories have come up pretty frequently. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your answer. And I have the last question for tonight, and it's knowing what you know now from your experiences last year, is there anything you would have done differently?
That's another really hard question. Um, I will say, I think that um, there is a way in which it was a blessing that we went into it knowing how little we knew because the level of intensity and complexity was incredible. Um, I will also say, I mean, you always wish that you can do more in many ways, but I think that, um, you know, um, there was there, the level of um, uh, the many different ways in which people were able to support students very quickly. And I will also say the creativity and the problem solving um, that went along with it. I think that's something that was, that was there. I mean, honestly, knowing what we know, could we have just skipped COVID? <laughs> that's what I would have said. We, you know, there was already a hardship fund because there were already a lot of needs that were going unmet. Um, and there were sort of hidden needs. And I think COVID has just made that, um, uh, I think it has increased the number of students who will, who have those needs and who will have those needs. And it has increased, um, you know, the scarcity of resources in general, at least in this moment right now, and the uncertainty, um, not just in the present, but also the uncertainty of the future. Um, and how things will play out for students. Um, Jared, you, you, you might have a, a better take on what do you wish we could have done differently? I don't know. <laughs> uh, That's, sorry, I'm like uh, double clicking. That's why I uh, started laughing <laughs> um, because uh, it was a whirlwind um, for us. And um, naturally a lot of our students were shocked um, and didn't really know how to how to you know respond to uh, this insane environment. Um, but one of the things that I uh, really thought about was I just wish that we uh, could have gotten a message out sooner um, that students could come to us uh, for support, um, especially with getting them home. Um, of course, we you know we found out hours before the students did, as most staff. Um, but being able to remove some of that stress from our students. Uh, would have been helpful um, and definitely had a positive impact. Um, of course, you know, that also includes uh, storage as well because, well, we saw a lot of students who had figured out a storage solution, um, kind of spending money that, that they didn't have, um, but we did have an opportunity for them to have their storage covered, but many people didn't know. Um, same idea with the flights. We had many students who we ended up reimbursing who um, purchased flights um, and then found, found out that we were offering that uh, support after the fact. Um, so in that case, it was just more so about the the just in, you know the communications um, you know advantage of getting that first jump uh, would have definitely helped relieve a lot of uh, significant stress from our students, but also um, allow us to be a little bit more prepared to serve those needs too. Oh, wonderful! Thank you so much for your answers and uh, for being here tonight to answer these great questions and for talking with us about the Unexpected Hardship Fund. This was a great conversation and I really enjoyed it. I know this was an extremely challenging year for everyone at Tufts and as an alum, it's always energizing to hear how my support is directly impacting the students today. I welcome Dean Lizariba and Jared to give some closing remarks as we conclude the conversation for tonight. I just want to thank everyone for being with us um, here tonight um, for your support of the fund, even in just getting the word out that this fund is there um, and in helping us, you know, being able to better support our students and to really, you know, have them get the most out of their experience here. Um, you know, there are uh, so many ways in which um, alums play an important role and um, just having you be aware and advocating and helping in these ways really means a lot to students um, and really makes a big difference. And it means a lot to us as well. Um, uh, 
because you know it, it is part of being uh, in this community um, and it's really good to have those links um, not just for our students here right now but for our students who have you know who have moved on um, and so I just you know huge heartfelt uh, thank you um, and a lot of gratefulness for all of the good work that that this fund and that you have all allowed us to do. Yes, um, you know, for, for me, I would like to echo the same, uh, you know, thanks. Uh, first, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who has previously uh, donated to the fund um, because it really uh, gave us the, the space to think about prioritizing our student safety um, and supporting them in every way uh, that we uh, talked about during this conversation. Um, and also uh, for me, you know, as we think about uh, the next coming months, we're really trying to find ways to, um, you know, continue to offer that level of care. Um, so please, what, you know, if you are able, uh, please consider uh, making a gift to the fund to allow us to continue to offer this support, as well as helping us get the word out and supporting the First Resource Center holistically. Thank you so much, Daniel Zariba and Jared for tonight. And thank you everyone for being here and joining our second March to the Top event this week. It was great to have you all here and we hope you enjoyed it. As a reminder that the Unexpected Hardship Fund is one of our funding priorities during our March to the Top campaign. Through March 31st, every gift to this fund will be matched dollar for dollar up to $35,000. Thanks to the generosity of Kathy Kwan and Ellen Eustens A22P and Harish and Roland Melwani A23P. Please help tough students facing unanticipated financial needs during this extraordinary time with a gift to the Unexpected Hardship Fund. You can maximize your impact by making your gift at givingdays.tufts.edu. The link for the site is also in the chat. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you so much for coming.